Hello and welcome to Asian Tech Forum. I'm sure you have wondered sometime how a smart camera, smart plug, IoT devices shows up on the app immediately after just by plugging into power. Because in typical home network, the NAT is a common phenomena. And when you use NAT, it breaks the device to device communication for services like IoT, home automation, uh, etc. So, how these uh, products are solving this challenge. Let's understand that. And for that, we will go back to the protocol called STUN protocol. First, let's look at what we have in agenda. First, we will discuss what is the problem we are trying to solve. Then, we will take a deep dive into protocol, what is STUN protocol, how it works. We will read the RFC R8489 together and I will highlight some of the key terminology concept for you so that this protocol is um, become clear and finally we will end with a Wireshark demo. So what is STUN protocol? STUN protocol stands for Session Traversal Utility for NAT. In older version, this is uh, UDP over NAT, but now it's not just UDP, uh, it has many use cases, not VoIP only, hence now it is called Session Traversal Utility. It is a network protocol used to allow computer behind the NAT firewall to communicate with each other. It works by sending a request to a stun server, as you can see in this picture. So two stun clients sitting behind in a, in a home network behind a NAT environment, and they ha do have internet connection. They reach out to stun server to know what is their public IP address and port look like. STUN is an important part of many VoIP and P2P communication, of, of course, WebEx, Skype, etc. STUN is a means. So what is the problem we are trying to solve? This is the problem we are trying to solve. STUN is a means for a client to learn the public IP address of NAT router through which the connection is NATed, here in this case, this router, in order to use that information when registering with the server that want to call back now or later. So this PC, if it want to make a VoIP call, a VoIP call to another client here, so if you think this is a caller, this is a callie, they need to discover their public IP address and port number. Okay. So let's understand how it works. Again, it's a, re a request response method. Stun protocol work by sending a request to stun server which then respond with the IP address and port of requesting computer. This information is then used to establish the connection between two computers. Right? Uh, in order to use STUN, two computers first send the request to the STUN server, so they must first resolve their public IP and port via STUN server, and then only they can establish a communication between them. So here, as you can see, workflow one between STUN client one and STUN server, it send a binding request, in turn, it receives a stun, stun binding response. Within stun binding response, it has its public IP address and port number uh, is, is comes as a part of response. When stun client one receives that response, it compares the original source IP and source port versus what it received in binding response. Comparing those two, it can tell or understand if it is sitting behind NAT or not. In most of the cases, source IP is a private IP address, while the response is mapped to a public IP address. Hence, stun client can determine NAT, presence of NAT. Okay, this is again a deep dive, a little bit about the terminology. Key stun client send a binding request. After receiving the binding request, stun server obtain a source IP address and port number and sends the binding response to each stun client. The binding response messages are carried as mapped address, ZOR mapped address, and response origin attribute. And when we look, go look, take a look at the Wireshark demo, these things will be much more clear. The stun client obtain the IP address and port number from mapped address. Uh, in binding response, compare the obtained IP address and port number with the source IP address and port number carried in the binding request. So it compare the response ZOR mapped address versus uh, the source IP address in binding request. So it compares the source address in binding request 
versus what it receive in response as sorbaptidrus. If they are different, a NAT device is used in front of the stunt client. After confirming the NAT detection result, each stunt client notifies the service module of the result. So basically, you are just trying to discover, or the client, client is trying to discover if it is sitting behind NAT, and then it passes on this information to the upper layer, which is the application in question. All right. So at this point of time, you must be wondering that how application gets stun details. Uh, so there are lot of stun servers, public, uh, publicly maintained stun servers, just like DNS. And here is a list of that, and I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, this is the GitHub page, and it has complete list of stun servers, which uses standard port 3478, 5004, and these are publicly maintained. Many application uses their application specific uh, or vendor specific stun server, which is managed by that institution or that product company itself. But basically, the stun details may be configured automatically in program or uh, if, as, as a means of DNS if it is a TLS uh, implication. But this is all uh, responsibility of the application itself. Okay. Disadvantage, main disadvantage is it's not very secure. All the data sent through the stun server is unencrypted and uh, it's not very reliable because it's UDP most of the time and UDP, as you know, there is no retransmission, but only it can uh, uh, send as a best effort, right? So now let's go and read the RFC together. Session traversal utility for NAT. This is the latest RFC 8489. Before that, 5389 was the version one. This is, you can call like stun version two. It has more use cases. So to read the RFC, I highly uh, advocate you would go to the table of contents and read through it. What I have done, I have highlighted a few things, uh, uh, important concept for you, and we will just go through that. And I'll let you read the RFC in your own time. Okay, so we, by now you know what is uh, stun and response and by request method. So let's look at this. Stun is a client server protocol. It supports two types of transaction. One is request response transaction, which client send to request to the server and server return the response. Second type of transaction is uh, client or server send an indication that generate no responses. So basically, those are the indicative uh, transactions but we will focus on uh, request response transaction only in this video what type of transaction include transaction id why transaction id because uh, this is udp and uh, in udp there is uh, unlike tcp where you can have sequence number and handshaking there is no way uh, to correlate request and response hence you have a transaction id so the transaction id help you uh, correlate between a request and a response it is a randomly selected 96 bit number for request response transaction this transaction id allow a client to associate the response with the request that is generated right other than that all stand messages start with a fixed head header that include a method a class and a transaction id the class indicate whether it is a request or it is a response. So what kind of packet it is. And then we have a lot of attributes. And attribute, as you know, it's a flexible way of encoding um, uh, new information or other information which, um, which can be uh, understood by a server and client. Right? So here is the process. In the binding request response transaction, a binding request is sent from stun client to stun server. So binding request is uh, sent. When the binding request arrive to the stun server, it may have passed through one or more NAT between the stun client. In home, uh, home environment, definitely one NAT, but sometime your service provider uh, do a double NAT. So there may be one or more NAT you have to traverse before you reach the stun server. As the binding request message passes through the NAT, NAT will modify the source transport address 
that is source IP address and source port of the packet because that is essentially NAT does. As a result of this source transport port of the address request received by server will have a public IP address because our stun servers are publicly accessible and port created by NAT closest to the server. This is called reflexive transport address. So this is the address your stun client uh, stun server receives or sees when it receives the request binding message. The stun server copies that source transport address into Zorma uh, mapped address attribute in the stun binding response and sends the binding response back to the stun client. So this is the trick. You send a request, stun client sees the public IP address and port number, it copies that in the response and send it back to you so that you know that this is my outside world identity. Okay. As this packet passes back through the NAT, NAT will modify destination transport address as um, it does in uh, incoming communication. And finally, client can learn its reflexive transport address located by the outermost NAT. All right. So there are two RFCs and there are multiple uses of this. Uh, also, the same port can be used for multiple applications. So hence, if you want to understand if whether it's a stun packet or no, you can use fingerprinting. That is the hashing of your request. You can use credentials. That means uh, some applications uses username and password mechanism uh, to authenticate itself with a stun server, right? But those are optional, those are not mandatory field. Stun message stru uh, structure. This is how the stun message look like. Stun message type, message length, message cookie, transaction ID. Right. These, this is the fixed packet format and then you have multiple attributes. And all these things will be clear when we go to Wireshark demo. Right. Uh, for example, a binding request has a class uh, of value 0 hex. 001. A binding response has a class of this 0b00 was a response request, 0b10 is a success response and uh, uh, encoded as x10101. So response is encoded as 0001, response is encoded as 0101. And you will see all these things um, in demo. Magic cookie uh, or message cookie is a fixed value in network byte header and it basically hashes the transaction id and some other field right okay so for binding method uh, as i mentioned there are options that you can some application uses username and password but, but that is an optional thing with no authentication no attribute are required unless the user is specific otherwise so these are all optional parameter all stun messages are sent over UDP or DTLS over UDP should be so the initial case use case was UDP for sure but going forward the new use cases are TCP as well and uh, as you can see stun services running on well-known port if you are doing a TCP then it is discovered by DNS you can discover uh, your stun servers by DNS Reliability, if it is a TCP use case, then handled by TCP itself. There is no retransmission at the stun protocol level. Okay, but in UDP, it is handled at stun protocol level. All right. There are a few security vulnerabilities uh, which I want to show you. DNS discovery of server in um, uh, TCP case, you can hard code DNS stun URI. Like I shown you a lot of stun server IP and name, you can hard code that in application. Or the default port for stun request is 3478. But anyways, each application have sometime encode its own uh, ports. But in public domain, it is 3478 for both TCP, UDP, and in case of TLS or uh, DTLS, it's 5349. Right. So there are some security vulnerabilities here, as you can see. Um, bit down attack prevention, 
HMAC key and all these attacks uh, is, is known and hence we are using th things like HMAC, fingerprinting, etc. to mitigate that problem. All right. So let's uh, go to demo now. As you can see, uh, this is the Wireshark capture and I'm just uh, filtering it with the protocol stun. It shows up in Wireshark as a protocol stun. Uh, you, let's not worry about the source and destination IP address, but let's look what we have in stun. So this is my ZOR mapped address request. As you can see, this is this is a transmission protocol, and uh, so this is a TCP use case. And let me see if I can show you something UDP as well. Okay, this is UDP. As you can see. UDP. So stun is for both UDP, TCP nowadays. Let's look at uh, the stun level itself. Here, as you can see, we have message type. Since this is a binding request, triple zero one. That's what the RFC says. And then we have message length. We have message cookie, ninety six bit of transaction ID. Message. Uh, this since this is a binding request, ZOR mapped address is all set to zero. And uh, the report is also set to zero. Then we have fingerprint and some hash map. So this request, when it made to uh, make it to the stun server, it is supposed to get a response. And once you get the response, you will see that uh, the actual uh, public address is encoded as SOAR mapped address within the attribute of stun. Right, so this is how the client discovers, and once it discovers that, it can go ahead and do um, a DNS uh, discovery and start creating a, a session with that. Also, you can see binding request with the username. So, as I mentioned, some applications support username and they create a random username, nuance, and other things so to make it more secure, right? But I think you got the idea. This is how basically an application supports uh, to discover the endpoint which is sitting behind NAT and make that application work seamlessly. So I hope uh, you enjoyed this talk uh, and it has uh, uh, satisfied some of your uh, 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 doubts that how these smart things work. And I hope to see you in another video. Thank you.